Thanks, everybody. Um, so uh, as the folks mentioned, uh, the title of my talk is A Revolution in the Clinic, um, New Doctor to Patient Rules. Um, and before I get into that, a little bit of quick background on council. Um, as mentioned, um, we offer genetic screening at key times in a person's life uh, when it really makes a difference. Uh, for parents who are planning to have kids, for women in their first trimester of pregnancy, uh, for people who um, are at risk of cancer or recently been diagnosed with cancer. We have over 110 scientists uh, and engineers, 50 PhDs in stats, data mining, and computational biology. Um, and because uh, it turns out it's a very hard engineering problem uh, to run a lab. Uh, we screened over half a million patients, and our lab is based out of South San Francisco, uh, California. So part of this discussion, I'll give you that background, part of this discussion is informed by uh, my own personal experience as well as that by, uh, uh, of running council. Uh, and so just in terms of our revolution today, we're seeing bits and pieces of the revolution today, and really this is across three key fronts, um, incentives, patient access, uh, and wait times. And to understand the revolution, uh, we really need to take a step back. Um, and the number one th thing I hear um, about healthcare uh, uh, in the U.S. particularly is like, why is your healthcare system so messed up? Um, it's almost a cliche to hear it, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, it really starts with incentives, and uh, I was on a panel on, on stage on, on Tuesday and we were discussing this. It's really simple. Everything in the medical system works exactly as it's intended to do. Um, in fact, everybody's incentivized exactly to, to, uh, to do what they're supposed to do. Um, let's take fax machines, even those make sense, um, which was insane to us coming from Silicon Valley. We're like, why the hell is it that anybody still uses a fax machine uh, in medicine? And it turns out for a doctor to go from consultation room A to consultation room B and go to a computer, log in, print something out, and uh, take it off the printer is slower than going from consultation room A to consultation room B and picking up something off the fax machine. So when we think about incentives, the doctor is compensated based on the number of patients they see as opposed to, uh, say, quality or other metrics, then it all makes sense. And so uh, part of our work is, is developing technology tools uh, to enable that uh, kind of flow. Um, so let's compare and contrast uh, different professions. Um, our lawyer. Um, when we uh, call our lawyer, he never refuses to pick up the phone. Um, if we call him on a weekend, um, it's Saturday night on Christmas Eve, he can talk about sports scores, World Cup, ad infinitum, you name it. Um, and there, there's an important reason why. We pay him an ungodly sum of money uh, per hour, so that's why he's always picking up the phone. Now, let's compare to, our, uh, to the classic physician, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, characterized as hard to reach, uh, time pressed. Um, their appointments are usually running late. Um, and of course, they still use faxes. Um, but they are working like maniacs um, behind the scenes. And then they get accused uh, of being paternalistic, particularly by people from Silicon Valley. Um, so it's ridiculously frustrating for them. And the reason why many physicians say, um, knowing what they know now, they wouldn't recommend medicine as profession. So, you know, my dad, uh, who's a doctor, uh, he told me, you know, whatever you do, uh, don't become a doctor. And so I was like, thanks, Dad. And what I ended up doing is running a company that relies on uh, working with insurance companies and serving physicians. So circuitous way of following his, his instructions. So really, you know, uh, the missing thing is incentives. Uh, when you can align incentives, you can reduce a lot of this stuff, and a lot of things flow from that. Um, some health plans and, and systems are working on what's known as shared risk models, uh, where a health plan will pay, say, an OBGYN for a shared risk package. Um, where the uh, pregnancy and all the screening, et cetera, is packaged into a bundled amount. Uh, same thing for oncology, all cancer care bundled into a particular amount, uh, rather than how many patients they see in a day. These are extremely hard incentives to get right, uh, but could be very, very interesting uh, if they work. And, but you know, overall, incentives are a hard problem to address. Uh, and uh, you know, the classic example that, that I use is really a barber. Um, you know, what does it mean to pay a ba barber based on the outcome? Uh, does it mean that your friends say it's a good uh, haircut, that your significant other, that your kids say it's a good ha haircut? So when you inherently, when you rate a service provider based on an outcome, it's very hard to get it right. Um, but if addressed properly, it could accelerate any revolution. So the next part is around patient access. Um, closely linked to, to incentives is patient access um, to anything, lab tests, uh, medical records, uh, really anything in medicine. Um, personally, I remember getting a CT scan many years ago. Uh, from a huge, well-known medical institution that everybody in this room would recognize, and then I tried to get the results. 
Um, I got the runaround. Everybody said HIPAA. Um, and just in, in, in case you don't know, HIPAA is a talisman you can use to get out of doing work. Um, so can I get my own results? No, uh, it's a HIPAA violation. Can I use the bathroom? No, it's a HIPAA violation. Um, actually, no, that's not what a HIPAA is in, really intended to do, but you know, uh, it's a great excuse. Um, seriously, you know, the, right now there isn't a high incentive to provide your own results, um, mainly because there's no consequences. For the institution I went to, it wasn't as if I was going to see another institution based on result release. Um, what's going to stop you from going to that institution? Um, in, in fact, you're instead paying for that person's expertise in a particular area. So that's why at Council, we tried to crack small parts of this nut. Um, we developed things like one-click result release for patients and physicians, so docs at the office can enter a patient's email and immediately return a, a result in short order. It's something insanely frustrating that we've seen a lot uh, and something we've been able to solve for both physicians and patients. And that really gets to a larger point. Can we use technology to unlock more and more of physician expertise rather than supplant it? I think that's the popular narrative of technology that it replaces uh, human expertise, but we are thinking about it as augmenting uh, both clinical expertise and, and patient uh, knowledge. Uh, and fundamentally, can the internet and technology transform the patient relationship from a passive consumer to a much more educated uh, buyer uh, of healthcare services? We've seen that across other domains, uh, but this is an important part in patient access. And then we come to wait times. So we talked about incentives, patient access, and then wait times. Wait times, these are one of the key pain points in medicine. Everybody has to wait for everything all the time. Uh, it means that people just throw their hands up and don't get basic things like screening done. Um, this is a key area where technology can play a role, an immediate role. Um, and at Council, as I mentioned, we offer genetic testing for uh, breast cancer susceptibility. Uh, the 32nd version of this is if you have uh, a mutation in breast cancer, in the breast cancer gene, you test positive, doesn't mean you have the disease, it means you have a high lifetime risk of getting the disease over, your, uh, over the course of your life. Uh, and you can do stuff like uh, take a specific drug regimen, um, do more frequent mammograms, or undergo surgical interventions, as Angelina Jolie made famous. Um, so there are things that you can do, but the, the question is uh, whether or not you're a positive for that particular mutation. So the old way of getting tested is really, really slow. Uh, you have to get set up with a doctor's appointment, which can be weeks out. You can go to a doctor's office. You have to fill out paper forms. Um, you have to get a sample. You have to wait for results and uh, wait for your results. And maybe in certain jurisdictions, like in New York or New Jersey, it'll take months to speak to a, a, a qualified professional uh, afterwards. Uh, in today's era, where people get frustrated and they're insanely frustrated with a 10-minute wait for an Uber, I mean, that's unacceptable. Um, and so we're inventing a few tools to simplify this experience. Today, you can go to council.com on your phone, request a prescription from your physician, get a kit that independent physician will review it, see if the order makes sense for you, sign off and send a saliva kit back to your house. Um, you can take the test, you can send it back to us, we'll run it at our facility, and you and your physician can review that um, uh, result on your own time. We also offer access to things like on-demand genetic counseling, which, which has been pretty neat. Um, so this allows you to compress a process that normally takes weeks or potentially months into a short period of time. And important, and really importantly, philosophically, it reduces the barriers to entry. People usually throw their hands up at screening and medical service because like, man, it's just a lot of work. Um, I remember interviewing um, one of uh, uh, the top people at Netflix um, who is uh, describing how many steps they, they cut out of the process to make sure that people can, get, can sign up on Netflix quickly. And uh, I laugh to think about medicine, which is uh, if there's a step that takes 12 steps or uh, something that takes 12 steps to do, somebody in medicine is figuring out how to make it 13 or 14 or 15. So it's almost the exact opposite philosophy. So uh, tying all this together, I wanted to share the story of a patient um, named Victoria, a young woman um, uh, in the, in the um, uh, um, Midwest of, uh, of the US. And uh, she has a really powerful story. Um, her mom was uh, diagnosed uh, at age 41 with stage four breast cancer um, after using hormone treatments to become pregnant with Victoria's sister, Elizabeth. And five years later, Victoria's mom sadly died. Um, Victoria was only nine years old at the time, and she was so used to having a sick mom that she wondered how other moms had the energy to do things like cook and clean after dinner. Um, so it was, kind of a, it was kind of amazing that that was her perspective. Um, as she grew older, she began to look more like her mother. Uh, and to paraphrase her words, she said, I wondered, um, in addition to the family resemblance, if I had inherited uh, my mother's breast cancer gene as well. And she had good reason to think that. Cancer runs in her family. Uh, her mom had four sisters and one passed away when she 
uh, was young uh, when she was seven of colon cancer. Uh, and her aunts had been tested, one of them had the genetic mutation. Um, so Victoria's fears really began to weigh on her. Well, she didn't think about it all the time. It was something that was in the back of her mind and it weighed her ability to, um, and hurt uh, her ability to really plan for the future and really impinged on her happiness, which was kind of sad to hear. Um, but ultimately, she wanted to find out if, in fact, she had inherited the condition, um, like her mom, um, so she could do what she needed to combat it. But timing was important as well. Uh, it turned out that uh, Victoria developed an ovarian cyst uh, at a young age, and that prompted her to go to her physician. Um, her physician recommended that she get screened with counsel to find out once and for all whether or not she did, in fact, carry this particular mutation. Um, this was Victoria's senior year of college, uh, by the way, so she was about 21 at the time. Um, and so really impressive that uh, she was able to take this into her own hands. Her results arrived when she was at the theater. It was a really freezing day. She ran out with her friend, went to check her computer with her physician, and uh, found out that she was negative. Huge relief for her. Um, and in her words, I found out that I didn't have my mother's cancer, but even if I discovered the, I had the experience, it would have been a good one. Finding out is much better than living with the uncertainty of not knowing. Now, had she been positive, her physician would have gone over the results with her, and she would have also had access to a trained genetic counselor in the moment, uh, getting connected on the order of minutes as opposed to months. It's really an extremely powerful story, an illustrative story of what changed here. Uh, the, the physician in this case was enabled to screen more patients because they had access to on-demand genetic counseling, because they had access to the entire post-test reporting system. And the patient herself became a very sophisticated consumer of medical services. Um, she had a, obviously a family background, and she was able to take uh, sort of her destiny into her own hands uh, and work with her physician. And so that's a really a few thoughts on how we see these new doctor-patient rules happening um, across these three different fields, incentives, patient, access, and wait times. These are all linked together. Um, and really, uh, just some food for thought and for everybody at the, at the conference to consider, our goal in health technology is to enable physicians to become better clinical advisors. Doctors don't want to be gatekeepers. Don't, doctors don't like this idea of being paternalistic. So can we invent technology tools that make their jobs easier and make medicine a joy to practice again? Um, and, and for patients, can we use technology to enable patients uh, to make better decisions and also be very informed uh, of uh, the information that they're uh, processing. So uh, thanks everybody for your time today and uh, I really appreciate the time to speak with everybody today at Web Summit.